today on Fixing the Money Thing. Let me ask you, who are you loyal to? That's a good question. Can, can they depend on you to fulfill your obligations and commitments? Now on Fixing the Money Thing, Gary's Loyalty, your Pathway to Promotion series. I'm Gary Cassie, and for nine years, we lived in a chaotic, stress-filled, visionless life. I cried out to God. He said, I want my people free. America's financial coach, Gary Cassie, shares the kingdom principles that changed his life, defeated his debt, and set him free. You'll never find your destiny until you fix the money thing. What is loyalty? Qualities like allegiance, faithfulness, obedience, and trustworthiness, to name a few. Now, from Faith Life Church, Gary Cassie and his Loyalty, Your Pathway to Promotion series. Today's message, can God trust you to be loyal? Loyalty is not a big topic, is it? No, in our culture, that's not like a hot item, is it? We don't really want to get into loyalty too much, it's just not uh, too popular. But loyalty has a huge impact on your life, huge. And so we're going to talk about that and trust it's going to benefit your life. The definition of loyalty, let's start there right out of the dictionary, says this. It's the state or quality of being loyal, faithful to commitments or obligations, faithful adherence to a government or a leader or cause. So let me ask you, who are you loyal to? That's a good question. Can, can they depend on you to fulfill your obligations and commitments? Or maybe you need people on your team that are loyal to you, vice versa, right? I mean, being loyal is, is so critical to life. And loyal is not a feeling. I can tell my wife I'm loyal to her, I love her, but if I don't take the trash out... Ladies, you missed the perfect opportunity. <laughs> Maybe it's just. <laughs> All right, two parts of loyalty you need to understand. According to the definition here, faithful to commitments or obligations, let me ask you a question. Is it possible to be faithful to your commitments and still not be loyal? Absolutely. Because if you're com you know, committed to your obligations, yet you are grumbling about your boss, are you loyal? According to our definition, you're loyal to fulfill your obligations and commitments, and you're committed with loyalty to whoever you answer to, and they go together. They go together. So I want to talk about loyalty because a lot of great things happen in loyalty, and a lot of bad things happen when we have disloyalty. So we're going to jump into that. Going back, of course, we've pastored 26 years, business leaders for 38 years, and uh, we've always had staff, people, clients, a lot of things happening. But, you know, I'll give you a couple examples. And Back in the early days, you know, I was young and my staff was young. We really didn't know. We all kind of jumped into this thing without a lot of training. But uh, I did have some problems. I began to recognize I had some issues happening in my staff back in the, in the beginning. And, uh, you know, things weren't getting done. And so I, I, I gave them a homework assignment. I said, I want you to read this book. And we're going to get together and discuss it on this date. I want you to finish it. So we got together at that date for our meeting, and I went around and asked them, did they read the book? And not one person read it. Now, there's, a, there's a symptom deeper than knowing how to read there. Would you agree? Yeah. All right. And so uh, the same season, we had uh, one of our children's Sunday events. You know, our, our children's church flopped. It, was, it, was just, it wasn't good. And Pastor Dorinda asked our full-time staff children's leader, uh, you know, how, how much did you prepare for this? I mean, it just, I, I give them credit for being honest. They said, I did zero preparation for it. Uh, you know, just an example. And another time in this season, we had a lady, now we had one door coming into the church back then, it was a warehouse we had church in. And uh, this particular Sunday, we had a lady back there and she was the greeter. And as she greeted people, she had made up a homemade flyer for a Sunday morning event that she was hosting and putting on the following Sunday. So everyone coming into church was getting a flyer from this greeter to skip church and attend this event the next Sunday without me knowing it. <laughs> Bless her heart, yes. 
Now, if you would have asked any of my staff or any of these people if they were loyal and they loved us, they would say yes. But obviously, they needed some help in training. Actually, without knowing it, they were being disloyal. Let me say this. You cannot build anything with disloyal people. If you try, you'll try to pick up false responsibility. You'll be micromanaging everything, which almost took me out of the ministry. You have to have loyal people. But listen, people need to be taught this. And again, this is a young staff. We had, you know, we had to you know, mentor. How many realize mentoring is important? Yeah. Absolutely. And so we need to mentor and train. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 says this, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Must prove faithful. Loyalty is not convenient. Loyalty will cost you something, but it is required. It is required. Luke chapter uh, 6, 10 Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. Leaders must first be tested, and then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons or as leaders, as we're talking about. Such wisdom in these two scriptures that you need to embrace in your life. So why is loyalty so critical? Why is it so critical? Because we're going to war. There's going to be pressure that comes. And in the midst of pressure, that's not the time to find out that the two before that you've built the house with cannot handle the weight. Right? You want to know before you get into the battle that there's been some testing, there's been some refining, there's some loyalty, that when you get into that battle, you don't have to look around and you've been abandoned. But no, your team is there. They've been tested. You can put confidence in that team. And this is vital to your life. Leaders, listen to me. Business leaders, listen to me. There's no shortcuts. You know it if you've tried it. You try to shortcut the process, you're going to pay the price. People need to be mentored and tested, and this is vital. Leaders, listen to me. When you put someone under your authority as you hire people or uh, you come on staff in the ministry, you need to remember this, that that person's voice will be magnified by your position, the leader's position. In other words, if I bring someone on staff, people are going to hear them speak as if they're hearing me speak. They're going to assume that whatever they're saying, I have already okayed. Is that right? And so you have to be careful. Remember, you're going to gain influence if you're coming under someone's authority. And leaders, you're giving influence. You're giving them your influence. You're giving them a, a bigger platform, a bigger voice. And you need to make sure that you both sound the same before you give them the platform. Amen. Come on now. Because you're going to find problems if you don't do that. So leaders, listen to me. You need to test people. You don't bring them in close because if they have a different voice, people are going to think that their voice is your voice. And you may not end up where you think you're trying to get to, right, leaders? So you have to be in agreement, right, in agreement. All right, so let's move on. Now, as a pastor or as a leader, I'm sure that you see people that have potential as leaders. And that's what, that's what you look for, right? That's what I look for. But I also understand that it may not be seasoned yet. Their maturity may not be ready yet. I have to understand there's the process of mentoring and leading and guiding them that must take place. There's a lot of people that have spiritual giftings as well as natural giftings that it does not qualify them for leadership yet. Okay, not yet. But how many know it's so easy to bypass that testing process when, you're in, when you need someone desperately in, in that position? And that's what you cannot, you cannot, cannot violate this process. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30 says this, whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters. That's what Jesus said. Pretty powerful words. Whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters. See, times will get tough. Any venture, any business, any church, anything, there will be pressure again. We want to make sure that we're all on the same team. Listen, anyone can become disloyal. Anyone. Satan's number one plot is division. The process is disloyalty and offense. And you see it everywhere in life. 
Understand this, open rebellion never starts openly, ever. It always starts in the fringes, underground. Never see it, you know, it's like a rotten tree. I remember we had this beautiful, 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 big oak tree. Had a storm come through and the whole thing fell down. I was totally shocked when I went outside to look at it. It was hollow. See, you've got to find out what's inside people. They may look great on the outside. Their giftings may look great. And God gave them those giftings for a purpose. But leaders, you have a job to bring that out in a proper season and a proper mentorship for their sake and yours, right? So how does disloyalty start? I I believe no one really plans to destroy their life, right? No one really plans to be disloyal. In fact, a lot of people, maybe most people, don't even know they're being disloyal. But we need to find out because this is how Satan operates, underground, undercover with deception. So we need to find out the pathway to disloyalty. Understand God has a pathway for loyalty. The pathway of disloyalty has a bad ending. The pathway of loyalty has a great ending. And we need to understand how they both operate. So today we're going to talk about the pathway to disloyalty. You need to understand how it starts, how it ends. All right, number one, you make a list. Number one, it starts with an independent spirit. Now, all of us are individuals. We all have creativity. We all have ideas. That's great. But an independent spirit begins to operate outside of the one that they're under in authority. They began to began to kind of just twist things a little bit, began to add to the instructions, but decide to procrastinate maybe, or I have a better idea. These people don't mean harm, but an independent spirit wants to be in control, wants to have the latest gossip, wants to put, put, you know, put posture themselves as in the know. This is an independent spirit. And you can't let that continue without mentoring that person because it doesn't stay that way. How can you recognize independent spirit, give them something to do they don't want to do? They'll start bucking it, changing it, better idea, whatever. You can always, they'll, it'll show itself. All right, now what happens you try to correct an independent spirit? What happens? Not always, we pray not, but offense. Now that's their choice. That's their choice, but correction typically many times brings an offense and that person actually leaves. If they leave, quit the job, they're one of the ones you'll hear, I've had 50 jobs in two years. No, this is how, the door keeps going. I mean, just rotates, rotates, rotates. And so as a pastor, we want you to win in life and live the good life. So you need to understand how these things operate. So number two on your list Offense. Matthew 24, 10 says, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Listen, offended people betray, and they foster hatred and division. Offended people are, di- are dangerous, friend. Dangerous. Offended people do not receive correction. The Bible says a righteous person invites correction. Now, offended people very quickly move to what number three is, the passive stage. They move from the front row to the middle of the rows to the end row to the golf course. (laughs) I can always tell if someone always sits in the same seat and now they're moving back, okay, what's going on? You know, then I see what happens. They disconnect from dream teams. They get off all the teams. They stop serving. They stop being involved. I know something's happening, right? The passive stage, people become uninvolved. We have to ask, as a pastor, we have to ask why, because people that love God are involved. People that love God are involved. I'm involved. I love my wife. I'm involved. I'm not passive. There's evidence of my love for her. I'm not passive. When you love God, there is activity. You're going to have a heart to be involved. You're not going to have to be legally forced to be involved. You're going to want to be involved. Jeremiah 48.10 says this, a curse on the man who is lax in doing the Lord's work, a curse on him who keeps his sword from bloodshed. Meaning when you're in a battle and you're not participating in the battle, you're not on the team. And the Bible says you're not going to have the blessing of God on your life. So you want to walk in blessing? Stay involved. Staying involved is healthy spiritually, but stay involved. A passive person moves very quickly now 
to the critical stage, which is number four. They've disconnected. They have a critical mindset. Everything's now being filtered through this critical picture they have, and they become critical. They see things that are wrong. But see, when you own something, you care. So like at your house, if there's a, a, a mark on the wall, you clean it off, right? You own the house. You take pride in the house. That's your house, but not the critical person. They see things that are wrong, but instead of wanting to fix it, they want to point it out. They're not getting involved. They're not helping pay for it, whatever. They're not doing anything to help the problem. They're just pointing it out. The critical person. Now, this critical stage, again, now moves quickly into what we call number five, the political stage. The political stage is now they're going to get a crowd around them that agrees to justify their attitudes, their lack of being involved. They're going to get people around them that agree with them. One of the greatest stories in the Bible, not great at what happened, but a great story is the story of Absalom in the Bible. A very famous story. King David had a Abs- son, Absalom. He had a son, Amnon. Absalom and Amnon were of two different wives, two different women. Absalom had a sister named Tamar. Amnon, her half-brother, raped her. Absalom, her full brother, was furious about this. And King David did nothing about Amnon. So Absalom put a plot in place to kill Amnon, which he did. He then fled Jerusalem for three years. And then he came back after, I think, two more years, uh, he came back to Jerusalem. But secretly, he had no respect for David. He was offended. Now, I'm not saying his offense was not, in this case, maybe justified somewhat. But it's a great picture of what offense looks like, how it operates in 2 Samuel chapter 15. So I want to turn there quickly and and take a look at it. Verse number one. Now, again, this is when Absalom comes back. Uh, He's been estranged from David. He's been out of Jerusalem now for five years. He comes back, and now he is in the area. In the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him, he would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, what town are you from? He would answer, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, if only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me and I would see that he gets justice. That is how it works, friend. Absalom was not in the palace. He was not even in the city. He was outside the city. This is how it happens. It happens behind the scenes. It's not open yet. Uh, From my experience, it happens to, it it, it preys on the babies. It happens on the immature. Uh, These people that want to to get a crowd, they work work with these people. And you need to watch that. This leads to number six, the deception stage. Now, you know that when someone's deceived, what do we say about people that are deceived, pal? What do they say? They don't know they're deceived because they're deceived. Now, at this point, along this pathway, there's hope. You know, if we bring correction, we bring truth, there's some hope that we can get these people turned around. But in the deception stage, they're already hooked hooked into that lie. It's hard to get them out of that stage. The deception stage is, I'm greater than my teacher. You know, I don't, I don't, there's nothing you can tell me. I don't respect you. Uh, There's nothing that, uh, you know, I can tell you what's wrong with you, but I I can't receive from you. Ezekiel 28, 14 says this, speaking of Lucifer, you are anointed as a guardian cherub for so I ordained you. You Remember Lucifer's story, right? Got filled with pride, but he forgot where he came from. You see, God is the one that made him that way. 
not his rebellion, made him with the talents and giftings that he was so proud of. You know, it's interesting that, you know, we all are different. God made us different. God made us different. Why should we have pride about our giftings and our spiritual giftings? Because we didn't do them. I mean, God gave them to us, right? For a purpose. But Satan, we call Lucifer Satan, forgot where he came from. And so many people don't realize that they're not an island. They didn't make the journey up themselves. There are many people and many people that invest in their life for them to be where they're at, but they have forgotten. The deception stage now leads into number seven, open rebellion. I remember when I told my staff back in the day when I was called to preach, and I was, God told me to launch a church here in New Albany. Of course, I had my company. I called my managers together and say, look guys, God called me to launch a church here. I kind of told them what was happening. The next Monday, I came into the office. My key manager's office was next to mine. But this particular Monday, I was shocked. He wasn't in his office. He was in my office with his legs, his feet up on my desk. And when I walked in, he didn't take his legs down from my desk. And he said, you know, you're going to pass your church. It's a great thing. But you can't do both. So here's really how I see it. You got three, three choices. You can give me the company or you can give the company to all the employees or you can just close it down. That's pretty open. <laughs> but no, it's my company and I say, eh, it's all three, not happening. Of course, that person left. After open rebellion, this is something you need to remember. I call it number eight, the execution stage. All rebels die in the end. Because who do they attract, friend? Do they attract loyal people? Not usually. They attract rebels. And rebels will turn on them just as they turned on their leader. And you're going to find out that's how it works. That the rebels always die in the end. When Absalom began to lead his charge to take over the kingdom. David's men went out to fight against Absalom, had to fight against his own son. And Absalom was riding his mule in the battle and he ran under a tree and the tree caught his hair and the mule kept going and he's now hanging in the air. And he died in that battle. Rebels always die in the end. They may not die a physical death, but they're gonna have trouble because they attract the wrong kind of people and you can't build with disloyal people. You wanna build with people who celebrate you, right? You wanna you hire people that are excited to be there, that are grateful for the paycheck and the opportunity and the opportunity to, to be advanced in promotion and they're thankful and, and they love you. So listen, the pathway to disloyalty is very subtle and you have to be aware of it. That's why I covered it today so you'll be, uh, you know, a, a, keen to what Satan's trying to do. You'll be aware of what Satan wants. He wants to get you off track on the wrong pathway. God's pathway always has great reward. 